द वे फॉरवर्ड इज थोड़ा बहुत बहुत स्वागत है मैं थोड़ा होस्ट हरजोत सिंह इस वेले सारी दुनिया में गुरु नानक पातशाह के पांच सौ पंजावे जन्म का उत्सव मनाया जा रहा है ये ना सिर्फ साड़ी सिख कम्यूनिटी बल्कि सारी दुनिया की कम्यूनिटीज और सारी दुनिया में इस दिन सैलीब्रेट किया जा रहा है अज असी आमंत्रित किया है रिलीजन के प्रोफेसर प्रोफेसर बलविंद सिंह पोगल जी ने जो कि होफसरा यूनिवर्सिटी में जी कुलजीत कौर बिंदरा सिख स्टडीज़ की चेयर है उसू प्रजेंटली होल्ड कर दे अज असी उन्होंने गल करा गुरु नानक के फिलोसफी के बारे प्रोफेसर पोगल यू आर वेरी वेलकम एंड थैंक्स फॉर टेकिंग आउट द टाइम एंड स्पीकिंग विद अस थैंक यू फॉर द इनविटेशन प्रोफेसर पोगल बिफोर वी स्पीक अबाउट द फिलोसफी ऑफ गुरु नानक प्लीज फर्स्ट टेल अस व्हाट इज दिस टर्म रिलीजन एंड व्हाट आर द वेरियस फैमिलीज ऑफ रिलीजंस अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड ओके रिलीजन इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टर्म बिकॉज इट वाज वन ऑफ द टर्म्स दैट द यूरोपियंस यूज टू क्लासिफाई the traditions that were non abrahamic mm-hmm. so there's a problem in using the word religion it's a 19th century construction hinduism buddhism sikhism jainism they're 19th century constructions and they're not terms that indigenous traditions use but if we're going to use the term religion we have to make it a more nuanced term and uh, one way to do it is to break that up into three families of religious traditions the abrahamic family mm-hmm. the indic family and then the east asian family just to give you a bit of sense of what each one of those is like mm-hmm. um the abrahamic tradition you have the one god concept and you have the notion that god is the true sovereign the king of kings which makes the um creation of a lesser extent which is subject the human beings are subjects to the king now in, there's a dividing line between god and man in that regard and that's an important line that shouldn't be crossed in the abrahamic traditions that flavor of the tradition is mainly to do with obeying the revealed law prophetically revealed law of god in the 10 commandments in the uh, sharia in the rules and regulations of those traditions mm-hmm. and there's a way to behave so belief and orthodoxy become important to the abrahamic traditions um so it's obedience to that law that is revealed beyond human imagination that's given as revelation mm-hmm. in the scriptures the torah the bible and the quran mm-hmm. that's the abrahamic traditions mm-hmm. obedience to that law the indic traditions start off with a very different conception it starts off with maya an illusion like you're in a cinema y- you leave the daylight and you enter into a fabricated reality but within moments you're captured by the film but you have forgotten that there's an exit and so the beginning point is illusion and what you have to uh, do in this situation is not obey a revealed law but to wake up to the dream of existence the illusion of life and that's why the buddha's title which means his title is buddha which means the awakened one you wake up from the dream of existence mm-hmm. so it's a very different setup and this indic family share terms of samsara nirvana uh, dharma etc and in those traditions um what one believes is not as important as what one does how one acts in the world especially how one acts beyond their own conditioning which is to wake up from the illusion of being trapped by one's own desire so this be- this is a very different situation you need somebody who has woken up you need a guru figure Mm-hmm. to be able to show you the way forward and the east asian traditions i'm rifling through these quite fast they're much more complex complicated as you can understand we'll go, go into the details later yeah, yeah. the east asian tradition mm-hmm. um let's just take one of them taoism if you take the yin and yang mm-hmm. uh, diagram you realize that that's a harmony mm-hmm. of t- two parts of one process it's not two things it's not a duality it's a um a, the light and day aren't two things separate mm. they occur in a harmony of one process it's a cyclical process and in that tradition one is to get back in tune with the harmony that is already existent within nature so here you have very, three very different r- families of religious traditions that st- have different starting points and different uh, practices uh, although there are shared elements mm-hmm. yeah uh professor uh, pogal we always uh, 
uh, see Guru Nanak as a revolutionary, as, as uh, saying something new, something unique, something that was not uh, said before or done before. Can you tell us how does Guru Nanak uh, differ from the prophets or religious figures who appeared uh, before him? This is a very important uh, perception that the uniqueness of Guru Nanak isn't forgotten and overlooked because mm -hmm. often when we think about Sikhism we think of Sikhism as a monotheistic tradition, as a religion. What that often does is make Guru Nanak or, or Sikhism a type. Mm -hmm. Here's a, these are the types of religions and Guru Nanak is just another type mm -hmm. and therefore he's just another prophet. Mm -hmm. But I beg to differ and I would argue that strongly against that and to say that all the types that are existent during the 15th, 16th century, Guru Nanak exploded. He revolutionized them. In fact, what he did was not bring an add-on view that fitted into the world, but changed the way the world and all its aspects was transformed, how it's understood. And so he, he creates a new paradigm. He creates a new world view. It's a revolutionary vision that he has. Mm -hmm. And in that vision, we have yet to understand, it's only 500 years old, 550 years old, just how deep and profound that vision was. Um, I, I can start to summarize uh, the, the newness of what he brought mm -hmm. through two analogies. One is um, the elephant story and one is the clay pot, the amphora. Before I do that, one should realize that Guru Nanak was an enlightened being, let's say he woke up to the truth, but so have many others woken up to the truth. But Guru Nanak, that was the beginning point, not the end point. It was a culmination like in the Buddha's story of attaining nirvana. It's mm -hmm. the culmination of his narrative and then he teaches. Mm -hmm. It's not a culmination point for Guru Nanak, it's the beginning point because what he then does is understand his awakening in the context of other people's awakenings, other traditions' awakenings. Mm -hmm. and this is brand new. The comparative point of departure is new in the Sikh tradition because of the way Guru Nanak engages the other's voice as part of his own mm -hmm. vision. Mm -hmm. He sees them as uh, necessary to relate your vision in a comparative way. Not to compare which one's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. That's the old paradigm. The new paradigm is to say what is the resonance across those traditions and that's the uniqueness of Guru Nanak. No one else has done that. Uh, Professor Pagal will go uh, more into those details. Uh, first, tell us what we popularly hear is that uh, Sikhism is a monotheistic religion. Yeah. Now, uh, we don't want to be you know, bound by these terms, but uh, is that a correct uh, understanding of the religion? Well, if you said, I have a song and it's my favorite song, and is this the correct interpretation of my favorite song? It might differ from what your interpretation is, and you might say, well, uh, which one's right or wrong? But you'd be mistaken because a song and a poem generates interpretations, it generates differences, it generates, uh, it engages the individual in a process of finding a deeper layer. So when you hear the song when you're seven, its interpretation is different to when you hear it when you're 17, mm -hmm. to when you hear it when you're 27. Mm -hmm. Now having said that, then we realize that the gurus, therefore, Gurbani, because it's poems, poetic songs, written to ragas, m musical melodies, the musical dimension and the poetic structure mitigates against the idea of systematizing the, the uh, Gurbani. Therefore, any label that we want to use, monotheism, pantheism, they're ways of understanding, but they're not correct interpretations. Mm -hmm. They're modes of interpreting. They're a stage of interpretation. Mm -hmm. So one could say there's a notion of one God, but there's also pantheistic notions as well. And there's also Buddhistic notions as well. So, Professor, I'm sorry, can, can, can I ask you to elaborate a little? What are these notions? What do we understand by monotheism? What do we understand by pantheism? Okay. And what is this concept of Buddhist? So in the Abrahamic traditions, yeah. monotheism means mono one, mm -hmm. theos, God, w the notion of one God. Mm -hmm. But there's one sole creator to the whole of the universe and is in charge of it and commands it and intervenes into history and tell, tells people when they've gone off the path and brings them back. So this uh, God that intervene, intervenes into history is not a part of history. 
human beings mess it up and then God intervenes again. So that's the notion of monotheism there, and it's exclusive. This is a very important point. If we're going to use the term religion, and if we're going to use the term monotheism, then we have to provide a nuanced understanding mm -hmm. as it applies to the Sikh tradition. Monotheism uh, is exclusive. The Torah is exclusively for the Jews. Mm -hmm. The uh, New Testament is exclusively for the Christians, and they would name the Hebrew Bible as the Old Testament, mm -hmm. because it, the New Testament is exclusive to them. That's what I mean by exclusive is that it's a sufficient truth for them. Mm -hmm. But for others, they would, it would necessitate a conversion to Christian, Christianity to be able to be a participate in that. That's why it's exclusive. Mm -hmm. Same similar with the Quran. You have uh, uh, the, the revelations there being understood exclusively. So that's monotheism, that word means exclusive revelations. Now Sikhism, if you want to say Sikhism is monotheistic, mm -hmm. you don't say, okay, it's monotheistic, but it's not exclusive. Okay. It's an inclusive monotheism, which makes it an oxymoron, because that's not the type. Mm -hmm. So it breaks the mold. Mm -hmm. In fact, you could say it's a non-dual monotheism, which is more complicated. Mm -hmm. That's an Indic term, uh, Dvaita and Advaita. Mm -hmm. uh, that notion of uh, a non-dual monotheism breaks away from this one God that's dualistic, this God and then there's creation. Mm -hmm. In the Sixth Scripture, the Creator is in the creation and the creation is in the Creator. That's a non-dual relationship. It's one process happening via two ways, if you like, mm -hmm. um, or two ways of understanding that one process. But, 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 but Professor Vogel, if, if we, uh, you know, if we try to understand this in uh, layman terms, mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a concept of monotheism where there is one supreme uh, mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. uh, and everything else is subservient, yeah. right? And then there's a concept of pantheism, a, a, mm -hmm. a term which has like gained some currency in the recent years, although it, it might not be a very recent uh, word, which says that... Uh, uh, you'll be able to tell us more what it exactly says, but what we understand is that it's the uh, God's uh, reflection or God is part of everything uh, uh, outside himself, or yes. he's part of it. It's, yes. it's, it's that they're not, they're not separated. Yes. So uh, in the monotheistic uh, uh, tradition, there is one God at the top and everything else is created by Him mm -hmm. and uh, they are separate. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in the other tradition, it's part of it. Mm -hmm. so, so what tradition uh, is uh, Sikhi adopting? Well, like I mentioned earlier, no one capturing of Gurbani is sufficient. Mm -hmm. So the Gurus knew that. They knew the limitations of language. That's why they chose music and poetry as the, the mode. They, Guru Angad, Guru Amardas, Guru Ramdas, the later Gurus could have said, this is what Guru Nanak meant, but mm -hmm. they didn't. Mm -hmm. They didn't shift to poetry, uh, shift to prose. Mm -hmm. They did the same thing they sang. Mm -hmm. So they inherently understood the limit of systematiz systematization and trying to capture it. This can't be captured, it's an experience mm -hmm. that resists being captured. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked about monotheism. So the gurus understood that that's a vocabulary mm -hmm. that Islam and Hinduism uses. Mm -hmm. So we have Allah Kudda, but we also have Hari Ram. Mm -hmm. They would use that vocabulary, mm -hmm. but they see the limitation of just having that vocabulary. They also use a, a non-theological vocabulary, which is the Buddhist dimension, mm -hmm. where you have uh, Shunyata, mm -hmm. or Sun, mm -hmm. a Sun Samad, you have a Nirban, mm -hmm. and you have that vocabulary. So you have a yogic vocabulary, a tantric, but Shiv Shakti, you have all these vocabularies, mm -hmm. and the Gurus Bani, because I said the beginning point was a comparative point mm -hmm. of departure. Mm -hmm. It was aware that there were awakenings in the other traditions as legitimate awakenings. But mm -hmm. what was not done by any of the traditions mm -hmm. was a collection of them, of bringing them together. What happens then when you bring Jesus next to Buddha, next to Muhammad? What happens then? And this is what Guru Nanak did. Professor Pogel will continue this conversation after a short break. The way forward is thought of her to Swagata, Aj Asi Gal Karea, Religion Day, Professor, Professor Pogal Jinal. Uh, 
Professor, before going to the break, you said that uh, there are two analogies uh, you would like to use to make us understand these concepts. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, the, thank you the, for remembering that. Um, yes, the first is the typical story, the Indian story of the elephant and the five blinded individuals mm -hmm. and they feel different parts of the elephant. One feels the ear and thinks it's a fan, one feels the tail and thinks it's a rope, mm -hmm. one feels the tusk and thinks it's a spear, etc. Mm -hmm. Now all of them have partial understandings but they don't know it's partial. Mm -hmm. I only know, they, they think it's the truth mm -hmm. and they argue and there's disputations until they take the blindfold off. Now when they take the blindfold off then they can see their individual truths that they were holding on to were actually partial truths of a bigger reality which is the elephant and they, they can see the elephant. Now this is not the situation that we find Gurbani in because that's an old situation. <laughs> it's, it's assuming that we have access to a, an object that all can agree, on, agree upon. Mm -hmm. But is God or the truth or the absolute such an object that all of us can agree upon? Or is it such an object that's mysterious and remains receding as we try to capture it, that misses our fingers as we try to hold on to it, mm -hmm. that goes through our vocabulary? So the situation with Guru Nanak is to understand that even after taking the blindfold off, mm -hmm. we still have differences of view, differences of perception, differences of conceptual understandings of that object, because that object has never come into view. And Guru Nanak's genius is to understand that sameness can lead to fascism, sameness can lead to violence, sameness can lead to majoritarianism. We have got the truth and this is the identity and this is who we are. And this is the truth. The idea that you can name the truth is something that the Indic family and the East Asian families resisted. Mm -hmm. And so the situation that Guru Nanak finds himself is that he's awoke, there's other people that have awoken mm -hmm. and have access to the truth, but they have different vocabularies. Mm -hmm. Now how do we handle that situation? Mm -hmm. And he realizes that the different vocabularies are still there, the differences shouldn't be negated. The differences are an opportunity to understand a much more accurate, real, holistic understanding of what the true object is. Mm -hmm. And uh, this leads me to the second analogy, which is the amphora, which is a, a Greek pot of a particular shape with two handles. And we know what the shape of the amphora is at the beginning, but let's say we come across it once it's been broken, we don't even know if it's mm -hmm. what kind of shape of pot it is. Mm -hmm. Now, when the pot is broken into these fragments, um, if we liken each fragment to a religion, a language, an ethnicity, an identity, mm -hmm. a nation, then we'll have a sort of understanding of what's going on here. Because sovereignty being defined by one fragment, that this, is our, this is who we are, as though the fragment is the reality itself. They've forgotten that they're part of a greater reality. Mm -hmm. That's how Guru Nanak approaches all these traditions. He realizes that all of them are fragments of a much greater reality. So his vision is unique and comparative and full of a diversity where difference is not a problem. Because the only way we can get a sense of the real picture of God or the Absolute is to bring the fragments together along the line of their difference, mm -hmm. not breaking their difference. When you put the fragments together along the line of their difference, which is not an easy task, mm -hmm then you get the first glimpse of a much larger object, the real object of what that fragment is a part of. Mm -hmm. And this is what Guru Nanak did, and it takes a lot of work mm -hmm. to travel for over two decades, yeah. to learn those vocabularies, to meet those people, to enter those different geographies, languages, uh, traditions and cultures, mm -hmm. and to start to see what the real object is. Mm -hmm. That's his unique genius. And, uh Guru Nanak did not even, uh, he, he has never used this word, why Guru? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Well, he says "vava" va in the Gur in Gurbani. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but as you say that he is he is not uh, restricted, uh, uh, you know, on a particular term the way we have right. one monotheistic, uh, yeah. one entity in Allah yeah. or something. He's not uh, named that uh, entity. Yeah. He's used the word "sat." That yeah, he's Th that's exactly just right. There's um, either you say nothing. Mm. Shakya Muni, Muni to become silent. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, either you say nothing or you say and keep saying endlessly. 
So you have Allah, Khuddha, Ram, Hari, and you, and then you say Nirban, Sun, Shiv, Shakti. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you say all of them. Mm -hmm. And so Guru Nanak was the only one that had the understanding and courage to understand that the real object that unites us all mm -hmm. includes our differences, includes our languages, includes the different concepts, but it's not just a weak passive inclusivity. It comes with critique. Mm -hmm. And the critique is to do with understanding oneself first, understanding one's own fragment first, mm -hmm. as part of the larger vision. And that understanding requires the breaking down of one's ego. Mm -hmm. Nationalism, identity politics, majoritarianism, this idea of this is who we are, mm -hmm. uh, immigrants are less, we're the, the indigenous people, whatever the, the situation. W what happens is that you get a dominant discourse and a subordinated discourse, majorita majoritarian discourse and a minority's discourse. And these are subservient voices. Mm -hmm. Guru Nanak's genius was to include everybody as an equal voice. Every, this small fragment is as much a part of the pot as a large fragment hmm. has an equally legitimate place. Mm -hmm. Number has got no uh, truck with Guru Nanak. It's not about number. It's about the shape and differences and the cultures, the diversity of a life. Mm -hmm. He's had the vision to understand that we need those vocabularies. That's why the Guru, Guru Granth Sahib is so rich in yeah, dialects, has different languages, languages, different and terms and concepts. Yeah, and and, and that, uh, that that might explain uh, to us what the concept of ek and nek mm -hmm. propounded by Guru Nanak is. Can, yeah. can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So um, we can perhaps also understand mm -hmm. uh, that the Guru Granth Sahib begins with the number numeral one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No other scripture begins with the number one. Mm -hmm. But this isn't a number, uh, this is to understand that the one is not the monotheistic one, mm -hmm. which is exclusive. Th that's what we have always understood. Right. Ik Onkar, yeah. one. Mm -hmm. The one is, you can, you can understand it uh, in a theological vocabulary, the gurus do, mm -hmm. but they also have other vocabularies. Mm -hmm. So what it is, is the difference between source and center. Mm -hmm. Now you have a center mm -hmm. which you think is called Harjot Singh and you have a history and a lineage and a language but that's not your center, that's a particular history of this particular form you're much greater than that. You're connected to the source. This is the difference between the center of a fragment mm -hmm. which people believe that this is the true origin of Englishness or Germanness or you know this is the true origin of uh, Hindu and Muslim Exactly. Nako Hindu, Nako Musliman means mm -hmm. that that's not your true center. The center of this fragment is the pot. Mm. That's the source. So there's a difference between the source of the pot, mm -hmm. which everyone has. Mm -hmm. All the fragments have the same source. Mm. That's the one God that includes difference. That's, that's the difference of Guru Nanak's vision. Mm -hmm. Rather than saying, oh, this language captures the truth, this concept captures the truth, this name captures the truth. Mm -hmm. This is where Guru Nanak's criticism comes in. Yes, your different name is wonderful, but it's not the s center, it's Only. the source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's part, it should be understood within the context of a comparative, pluriversal or a, a, a diverse vision. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's, that's uh, we understand that's what he means by pluriversality rather than universality. Yes, so universality mm -hmm. would be, has always been used by people who are in dominance. Mm -hmm. A dominant discourse is able to enunciate their regional values as universal. A t particular example here is religion, Christian traditions, colonizing the the. the uh, Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, the British, etc., all Christian nations in their languages had a concept that dominated, colonized the globe. 84.6% mm -hmm. of the globe was colonized mm -hmm. in the, by the 1930s by Christian European races. They universalize their regional values in the name of race, racialization, mm -hmm. and religionization. And that religionization um, uh, is a particular term from their traditions. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, so it's a top-down model. One fragment speaks for all the others. Mm 
and makes them minorities. Mm -hmm. Whereas what Guru Nanak did was a pluriversal, which is a horizontal, it's not top-down. It mm -hmm. uses all the minority voices, which is a revolutionary mm -hmm. move. So we'll continue this conversation after a short break. The way forward is thoda fir tu swagat hai aaj assi gal kar rahe hain professor pogalal uh, professor it's it's a, it's always said that guru nanak showed the third way uh, which is inclusive of all ways and he says that there's no one perfect way C can you can you tell us more about about that right so this goes back to what we were saying earlier in terms of uh, one language one people one in one place mm -hmm. naming the way for everybody else mm. this is not the the way the how guru, um, guru nanak understands it his way was a resonance a thirdness mm -hmm. beyond what the fragments could see themselves mm -hmm. and he created um, uh, a way that resonated and the best medium to do that was through music mm. and poetry and song song mm. is a collective form mm -hmm. now what is it that resonates across the traditions? What is the third way? And that is, he says, make mercy your masjid, hmm. make uh, compassion your prema, etc. He, he, he goes through. What it is, is that the paraphernalia of a tradition, whether it's the prayer mat or the yogi's uh, paraphernalia, um, he says that's fine, that's diversity, mm -hmm. but that should be should not displace the true virtues of compassion, of humility. Mm -hmm. That's what you should be focused on and that's what makes Sikhism a practical tradition but it also makes it relatable to all human beings. Humility, truthfulness and uh, a righteous living is what forms the resonance across traditions. That's how we get connected with other human beings. Mm -hmm. But we get connected and learn about the way they are humble and what leads to humility in the way of the form of that tradition. Mm -hmm. But it's humility that they're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that's how it is. See, uh, it's, 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 it's a very unique and uh, commendable uh, the way Guru Nanak does not seek to convert anyone mm -hmm. but um, you know he, he pushes them to transform within their traditions uh, example is by yes. Mardana yeah. he was a Muslim and mm -hmm. he was doing all his five prayers uh, mm -hmm. being uh, with Guru Nanak mm -hmm. and he stayed Muslim mm -hmm. till till end of his life mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. he was never he was never converted to Sikhism mm -hmm. or, or anything mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's where uh, we, we get the source for Guru Tegh Bahadur's martyrdom uh, when, when Guru Tegh Bahadur was um, offering his head the mullahs asked him are you a Hindu he said no he said uh, do you want all these people to convert to Sikhism he said no he said, why are you dying for them he says I want to defend their right to live the way they want to live so he showed respect for their tradition and encouraged them to live within their own tradition is, is that right is yeah, that this is uh, such an important point. Mm -hmm. uh, one way we can understand this point is that often traditions begin through one language, through one person, mm -hmm. and naming it. Mm -hmm. The Sikh tradition begins with a relationship. Mm -hmm. Music is relational. Mm -hmm. It's an affective, it's not a cognitive mode. It has cognitive dimensions, but the primary mode is an affective mode. It makes you feel. Mm -hmm. And the feeling is relational. One's love for God is a relational thing. Um, and it's sharing. It's a collective sharing. It's a social feeling. The feelings aren't just personal. It's a collective uh, feeling. Now that relationality, seeing oneself through the other's narrative, mm -hmm. is the comparative frame that Guru Nanak began with. So the Guru Granth Sahib is a collection of multiple voices that share this mm -hmm. resonance. And that uh, relationality shows you that the idea of one truth over another is missing, is a, a shallow way to understand human beings. Or incomplete truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us more about the concept of non-duality? Mm -hmm. So, um, if you say Guru Nanak the Sikhism is monotheistic, mm -hmm. I would have to say, well, it's a non-dual monotheism. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to the early distinction that with the Abrahamic traditions, there's a strong line between, a dividing line between God and humanity. Mm -hmm. 
in non-duality that's a dotted line mm -hmm. it's perme uh, is uh, permeable and the relationships can change so guru nanak has a student mm -hmm. who's not a part of his family by lena who becomes a sikh and then becomes a guru mm -hmm. Same, similar with Guru Gobind Singh, mm -hmm. he creates the Khalsa, but then asks to be initiated into the Khalsa. Now mm -hmm. this is very unique. Mm -hmm. This is how we understand the notion of non-duality. Mm -hmm. well, non-duality means you cannot name the center. You can only name the source. Mm -hmm. Non-duality could be... Uh, non-duality misunderstood as a center becomes dualistic. We have the truth, this is our position, we're the ones in the right, you listen to us. Mm. That was always broken down by Guru Nanak because that led to a master-slave relationship, mm. a dominant and subjugated voice. Mm -hmm. Non-duality means every voice is legitimate and needs to be heard. But it has, it's not just any and every voice, mm -hmm. not everybody's included in the Guru Granth, mm -hmm. it's only those individuals that lost their ego, that were transformed. But they did it in their own way, they did it in their own traditions, and they're included. So the non-duality means that there is no one, there's not a center where there's another center to compete with. There's two. Mm -hmm. There's one source, and that's it's non-dual because it's expressed in its diversity. That's the difference with uh, Guru Nanak from other forms of non-duality, where it's more of an intellectual and metaphysical concept. Mm -hmm. See, uh You've stated that uh, identifying the creator with the creation is, is, is what uh, distinguishes uh, Guru Nanak's philosophy or the Sikh uh, tradition from Hinduism and other Abrahamic uh, faiths as well. Can, uh, yes. Can uh, you elaborate? Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are notions of non-duality in Hinduism, of course, Advaita mm -hmm. Vedanta, etc. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, but they have a notion of illusion and illusory nature, nature of reality, whether it's in the yogic system of uh, Purusha and Prakriti, mm -hmm. there's two principles, mm -hmm. and it's how they relate. Whereas uh, what Guru Nanak is saying is that the non-duality in the Sikh tradition is um, one source that is expressed through an infinite number of vocabularies. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a really important difference because it's not just a subjective intellectual idea, it's a lived philosophy. Guru Tegh Bahadur martyred his own life mm -hmm. for the c cause of freedom of religion for others. Mm -hmm. So it's a lived reality that the other is a part of one's tradition in a lived way, not just an ideology that you can say, oh, well, we have a notion of inclusivity, <laughs> but we don't have any practice of inclusivity. Mm -hmm. And that's where the difference is with the Sikh tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, when, when we uh, talk of, uh, you know, the, uh, well, let's use the word God as being part of his creation. So what is the concept of sovereignty in the Sikh tradition, this God's sovereignty? Right, so again I would have to say the sovereignty is of the source hmm. and all life shares in that sovereignty. So the sovereignty comes from Europe, a notion of uh, dominating a particular area and being sovereign over that area, a king, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. A king is sovereign over a particular area. Now that's, that's the notion of the fragment separate, so each fragment has its own sovereignty. This nation against this nation it has its own sovereignty. It's territorial, it's got a boundary, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, Guru Nanak had a radically new definition of sovereignty. Raj isn't that territorial Raj. Mm -hmm. The Raj that Guru Nanak started to talk about was to do with the sovereignty of the source, the pot. Mm -hmm. That has sovereignty, and that's what you were saying, like God has sovereignty. Mm. So this God, which includes diverse expressions, mm -hmm. because this nation is a part of that sovereignty, and this nation is a part of that sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So when the fragments come together, the sovereignty is glimpsed for the first time. Mm. No one nation is sovereign by itself. A fragment isn't sovereign by itself. It's only when it joins with others mm -hmm. that it becomes sovereignty. So Sikhi, Sikhi is a learning that connects oneself to the other, and, and sh that sharing, that connecting, s you get a glimpse of the real sovereignty. Not, sovereignty isn't mine. Sovereignty is we. Mm -hmm. And the we, the plural reversal, the ground up, not the top down, 
the ground up means that we all share in the sovereignty of that one source, but we have to work to that. And what's the work? On the ground, practical connections with other human beings to such an extent that all beings flourish to the state of awakening to the state of becoming Gurmukh, or uh, in different names in other traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, Gurmukh being somebody that is uh, um, beyond their ego, beyond home. Mm -hmm. So sovereignty is tied to one's ability to listen to hukum mm -hmm. over home, mm -hmm. rather than just listening to home, mm -hmm. one's ego. Mm -hmm. So this is a new concept of sovereignty that ties both the European notion and the uh, subjective notion of mystical awakening mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. and, and this uh, sovereignty, uh, Guru Nanak does not restrict it to any section of the society or any no. uh, particular people. It's for all. It's yeah. for all, all humans. Yeah. So uh, we will uh, continue uh, this discussion after a short break and uh, we'll ask you to sum um, everything up. What do you think is unique about uh, Gurbani? Uh, we'll come back to that after a short break. The way forward is Tawla Firtu Swagata, Matt or the host Harjot Singh. Professor, we uh, started talking about uh, the uniqueness of uh, Gurbani and there are a couple of things which uh, I would like to uh, address uh, before, before we sum up the whole thing. You see, another thing that was unique that Guru Nanak uh, talked about was conduct. In, in traditional orthodoxy, it was only your worship and the way you held your rituals, right? Th there's again a term, let, let's not be bound by terms, but there's a term called orthopraxy, which uh, adds uh, meaningful and good conduct to mere worship. Can, can you tell us more about that? So on the large scale, mm -hmm. um, orthodoxy is dominated by the Abrahamic traditions. Mm -hmm. The orthodoxy means right doctrines, right beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that was primary to them. They also have practices. They, uh, you have to carry the cross, you have to do, you, you know, you, you live in the world and mm -hmm. you have charity. A lot of rituals. Yeah, lo you, you, there's practices there. Mm -hmm. But the order emphasis is on a correct understanding, the right belief believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, etc. Like. Mm -hmm. So that orthodoxy is more related to the Abrahamic traditions. Orthopraxy is part of the South Asian and East Asian traditions, mm -hmm. which is primary. So for Hindus, it doesn't really matter what you believe, it's what you do. Orthodox Vedic, orthodox Vedic notions, there was an orthopraxy. So how you pronounce the mantras, how you pronounce the Vedic sounds. It's getting the sound correctly, pronounced properly. Mm -hmm. That keeps the universe in its resonance, etc. So, and therefore, beliefs were secondary, tertiary level. So it's a matter of emphasis uh, a bit as the differences between the traditions. Mm -hmm. and what Guru Nanak understood about orthopraxy was that orthodoxy can lead to an identitarian politics. Mm -hmm. As soon as you can say you got the right belief, mm -hmm. then you have the right people to follow, and then you have wrong people. <laughs> you have people who don't believe. And suddenly the focus becomes on the doctrine, which is a cognitive, intellectual conceptualization of something really profound, revelation. Mm -hmm. And that transition into naming something and capturing it and writing a list of beliefs mm -hmm. is deeply problematic because then people get attached to that and then we argue over it. Mm -hmm. Whereas orthopraxy, you can't uh, commodify in the same way. A song can't be commodified in the same way. It, the song's purpose is its transformative feeling. Mm -hmm. and, if, and, and, and you can listen to it again and again and be moved. So that is orthopraxy, is something that people can share mm -hmm. and people can't commodify. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that there, there, there's some uh, traditions which say that uh, your conduct doesn't matter. We've seen that in some uh, Christian uh, doctrines as well, but uh, uh, Guru Granth Sahib is replete with uh, uh, shlokas like yes. uh, Nirmal Karam, Karmo Ap. Yes. There's an emphasis yes. on Karam. Yes. That's that, that's very profound, uh, Professor. You know, there is a new understanding uh, today that, that we have gained into the Sikh psyche and, and Guru's. Uh, transformative uh, 
uh, revolutionary uh, beliefs when it uh, you know in context of uh, social transformations whether it was women's right or equality of races and caste and uh, today uh, there's a little more understanding of where all that source comes from can, can you tell us a little more about that yes just to tie on to finish the answer for the last question mm -hmm. about orthopraxy similar move that the Buddha made against the Hindu caste system, the Brahmanic caste system, mm -hmm. where value was eventually deteriorated into an inherited th uh, vocation. Mm -hmm. So the Brahmins are on top, Kshatriyas and mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. And the Buddha rejected that and said that your value, your uh, uh, standing in society should be based upon the merits of your deeds. Mm. That, so therefore he, he made this equality. Guru Nanak also followed that same thing and repeats the structure in terms of the focus on deeds. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the most important thing about orthopraxy. Mm -hmm. And in terms of therefore social transformation, mm -hmm. what we get are structures, institutions that include the other. The Golden Temple or Harmandir Sahib, Darbar Sahib has four doors mm -hmm. on each side. This is institutionalized reflection of the fact that all people from all cultures and all languages and all traditions are welcome here. Mm. And um, we have, uh, you've already mentioned Pai Bandana, we have uh, women's equality, we have the notion of um, inclusivity mm. being institutionalized, mm -hmm. the legitimacy of the other's voice as being part of oneself. So Myanmar lays the foundation stone for the Harmanda Sahib, mm -hmm. etc. So the inclusivity of others as part of one's own tradition becomes a practice point, a social way to be in the world, not to be segregated and um, I mean Sikhs have also suffered from being made into a religion, mm -hmm. Sikhism mm -hmm. and that at that same process, mm -hmm. the reform movements and with the British presence they've also been segregated from a heterolingual space of mm -hmm. Punjab mm -hmm. into a monolingual space mm -hmm. such that the heterolinguality, the multiple languages that were people spoke, mm -hmm. where you include the other as part of your one's own register. Mm -hmm. You have the other inside you. Mm -hmm. You have their language inside you. Mm -hmm. uh, rather to a pathological condition of a monolingual person mm -hmm. who then has to translate mm -hmm. to get the same feeling. That's what the British did. They made Sikhism as a monolingual monotheism. Mm -hmm. So they made Punjabi for Sikhs, uh, they made um, Urdu for Muslims and Hindi. So this was split mm -hmm. and this is a, a violence mm -hmm. to the natural diversity inherent within the Guru's vision that's pluriversal, which includes the other's narration as part of its own. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to maintain. Mm -hmm. Partition was a devastating uh, outcome for Sikhs, mm -hmm. as we know. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and uh, clo colonialism, uh, it, uh, that was the end result of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, the colonized mentality still maintains. Mm. We're starting to live in the structures that go back to the 1870s and earlier, mm. where it's a religion, it's monotheism, it has set beliefs. Mm. Where orthopraxy, uh, non dual monotheism, and not a religion a way of being in the world that includes the other through relations of love is what Sikhi is about. Mm -hmm. So we have to constantly work at doing that. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to defend that. Sikhs needed to defend that vision, needed an army, needed mm -hmm. to defend itself. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Khalsa that was created is part of the sovereignty of the Amphora, the mm -hmm. pot. Mm -hmm. it's, but it's been misunderstood as in some places, not in all places, as being Sikhs are sovereign. Mm -hmm. And Sikhs need to have uh, uh, equal, they need to be acknowledged as e have an equal voice. Mm -hmm. But there's a sophistication to the Guru's notions of sovereignty uh, that uh, sometimes is missed because of the uh, uh, imposition and inscription of colonial categories that modernity, the modern world, is made up of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Funding structures, institutional structures, politics, uh, self namings are so important. It's hard not to be a part of that world. Mm -hmm. So, whilst I want to return to Guru Sikhi, mm -hmm. I have to also contend with the construction of Sikhism. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no returning back to Guru Sikhi without acknowledging the modern constructions that we're actually divided by. Mm -hmm. So, there's a complex tax there, task there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Professor, I, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, th this is uh, something that uh, we will have to talk uh, more about. I would like you to uh, elaborate more on this. Uh, you don't see uh, the concept of Khalsa as created by uh, Guru Gobind Singh in uh, somehow in contradiction uh, with with, right. uh, with uh, what Guru Nanak uh, uh, created. Right. right? So we, we will we'll have to talk uh, more about this. Uh, time uh, does not permit right now. What I would ask you to uh, do is uh, for now sum up uh, and get, tell us how uh, this, this whole uh, concept uh, of Guru Nanak, how uh, Guru Granth uh, and how this this message of Gurbani is unique and, and, and what exactly is that message? Well, there's many ways to formulate that but I want to answer it in a particular way mm. and that is to realize that a lot of interfaith dialogue mm. revolves around if we could all agree, mm. if we could just all believe that we have the same, we're the same, it operates on the notion of sameness mm. and I've already alluded to the fact that that could lead to a certain kind of violence. Mm -hmm. What, because it always sees difference as a threat, Guru Nanak never saw different traditions, different languages, different cultures as a threat. Mm -hmm. This is his civility, this is his humanitarian vision. Mm -hmm. He's able to see that difference is not a threat. Now when difference is not a threat, what happens is that you have the possibility of seeing a larger vision. Mm -hmm. Along the line of the tessellating difference, the jagged edge of each fragment, mm -hmm. when it tessellates with the next fragment, that, that line is still there. Mm -hmm. it's not era it didn't erase mm -hmm. the line. But when they come together, mm -hmm. through the difference, mm -hmm. it fits, mm -hmm. then you have a larger vision. And that was Guru Nanak's uh, key uh, revolutionary insight. Mm -hmm. if, if we can say Guru Nanak's insight, it comes from uh, above. It comes from, from, a so from the source. Asan Professor Balbinder Singh Pogal, Asi Guru Nanak de Falsfe Varia Jirana Galkiti, Asi Egal Agevi Jari Dakange. Professor, thank you very much thank for you. speaking with us uh, today, taking out your time. Tusi Vekthero, the way forward.